History as it happens, January 2nd, 2023. Understanding Emancipation. Is a man whose roots go deeply into Southern soil. I know how agonizing racial feelings are. I know how difficult it is to reshape the attitudes and the structure of our society. But a century has passed, more than a hundred years, since the Negro was free. And he is not fully freed tonight. It was more than a hundred years ago that Abraham Lincoln, great president of another party, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But emancipation is a proclamation and not a fact. Nearly 60 years ago, Lyndon Johnson invoked Abraham Lincoln to inspire Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act. The Emancipation Proclamation was a major step in a process of world historical importance, the abolition of slavery. But as Johnson said, the revolution was incomplete and still is today. Does that mean Lincoln's proclamation and the anti-slavery amendment that followed were frauds, betrayals? Some historians say yes. And that's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. There's so much that's awful about human history that you get something good something desirable, like the abolition of slavery. Or in the case of the American Revolution, for example, in very old fashioned terms, you get the abolition of monarchy, the separation of church and state, the abolition of primogenitor and tail, banning of noble titles, things that I would think that you'd like. But instead of recognizing the things that I think were progressive and focus entirely on the things that these progressive achievements didn't achieve seems to me to deprive us of the crucial precedence for things we might want to do now. Well, Happy New Year and happy 160th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. A day late. Sorry, we don't uh, publish the podcast on Sundays. But anyway, January 1st, 1863, a date we learn in our grade school history classes. Lincoln freed the slaves, or did he? You know, I recently attended a book event at Politics and Prose here in Washington, a famous bookstore. The author was taking questions from the audience about his book on the Civil War and Reconstruction, and a woman took the microphone they pass around at these types of events, and uh, she corrected the author. She said he was wrong to say the 13th Amendment ended slavery. Slavery, as she put it, was alive and well in America because of mass incarceration and unpaid convict labor. So this crazy idea is known as 13thism. The 13th Amendment is not our focus in this episode, but it is related to what we're going to talk about with James Oakes, the great historian of slavery and antebellum politics, author of Freedom National, among other excellent books. So the Emancipation Proclamation, 160 years ago. Harvard Law professor Noah Feldman published a book last year arguing the proclamation was illegal and unconstitutional, that Lincoln basically acted like a dictator in issuing it, and that secession was legal. Yes, secession. Historian Chris Monjapra wrote a book arguing that the Civil War at its origin had nothing to do with slavery and abolition. That is a quote. In his view, the proclamation and then the 13th Amendment changed almost nothing because large numbers of black people were re-enslaved. Outside of academia, I can recall a popular meme that circulated online during the Black Lives Matter protests in summer 2020, warning folks not to say the 13th Amendment ended slavery because it allowed for convict slavery to continue. So it's never a bad time to revisit old subjects such as this one, because the subjects may be old, but the issues are fresh. Events like the Emancipation Proclamation should provide an opportunity for Americans to come together around a shared sense of our past. But as with just about everything else, Lincoln's proclamation now serves as another fault line in the history wars. James Oakes, welcome back. Good to be here. And let me wish you a happy new year. 
You too. You too. So I've been forced to dip into the Oaks canon once more. I've read your twenty <laughs> your twenty fourteen book to prepare for this, The Scorpion Sting, Anti Slavery and the Coming of the Civil War. You know, if you keep coming back on the podcast, eventually I'll read all your books. So <laughs> That'd be six times. <laughs> well, unless you write uh, one about Bob Dylan. So, you know. Who I'm uh, oh, yeah. Right. I'm never going to. Yeah. As I I'm like to remind to our that. friend, Sean Wilentz, that uh, I've read every of his books except for the one about Bob Dylan. So Exactly the same thing with me. Yeah. Exactly the same. <laughs> and well, if you write something about Eddie Van Halen, maybe I'll read that. There so uh, <laughs> amazing how much time has flown by. You were on back in the middle of the summer. We did a conversation about July 4th speech by Frederick Douglass in 1852. Right. I'm going to start this conversation the same way I started that one. I'll repeat to you what you told me to start that interview. You said, right now, at this particular moment in our history, too many Americans who think of themselves as progressives have lost the faith in the possibilities of the United States that Frederick Douglass enunciates so beautifully in this speech. What are your general thoughts about this as we uh, mark another major anniversary? Well, I suppose I could say the same thing about the Emancipation Proclamation that I said about Frederick Douglass's speech, there's, there's a curious tendency among people who think of themselves as progressives, as I do, to focus on, on things that I consider essential to the history of progressive movements in the United States by focusing on their shortcomings, what they fail to do. Right? What did Reconstruction fail to do? What did the Declaration of Independence not really mean? What did it fail to do? How did the founders fail to do? I'm not a great man historian. I'm not somebody who who writes hero worship style history. It's just as a progressive, you know, there's so much, there's so much that's awful about human history that you get something good, something desirable, like the abolition of slavery. Or in the case of the American Revolution, for example, in very old-fashioned terms, you get the abolition of monarchy, the separation of church and state, the abolition of primogenitor and entail, banning of noble titles, and things that I would think that you'd like. But instead of recognizing the things that I think were progressive and focus entirely on the things that these progressive achievements didn't achieve, seems to me to deprive us of the crucial precedence for things we might want to do now. And worse than that, some folks are saying the 13th Amendment actually re-enslaved black people. We'll get to that in a little bit. Along those lines, when I was thinking about inviting you back on to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, I said, well, again, you know, Emancipation Proclamation, everyone knows this. 160th anniversary. I mean, that's not the 150th anniversary. Why, you know, return to this? Well, I'm the host of the podcast, so I can do whatever I want. And <laughs> it's never a bad time to refresh our memories about what these important milestones in American history mean, especially nowadays, given what you just said and the ongoing national reckoning on race. So maybe I should just start with, how is the Emancipation Proclamation consistent with centuries of military emancipation based on what were called the laws of war? It's actually not centuries. It's a, okay. it's a it's an 18th century inference drawn from the laws of war okay. that's associated with the emergence of serious critiques of slavery. Well, so there so you go. I'm already having my memory refreshed. <laughs> it wasn't centuries. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Right. It emerges as far as I can see. I mean, there, there have always been times in war when some slaves were emancipated, but the general history of of slavery, anyone who studies the history of slavery knows that over time, over the millennia, the largest single source of slaves is war. War produces mass enslavement, right? And starting in the 18th century, you started to see belligerents emancipate on a large scale, not simply emancipate slaves who are willing to come to your armies and fight, 
but just emancipate large numbers of slaves in an effort to win a war or suppress an insurrection. The Spanish started doing that in from Florida into Georgia in the early 18th century. The British did it during the American Revolution. The famous one is Dunmore, but that was the traditional. That was Dunmore's proclamation in late 1775 offered freedom to slaves who came and joined the British troops. But later, British officers simply issued blanket offers of emancipation. And the Americans accepted that. They accepted that in the Treaty of Paris, that any slaves who had been emancipated and carried away by the British were not recoverable and you couldn't get your money back for them, right? And they accepted that. All of the debates over the Jay Treaty, which also accepted it, proved that you know, you couldn't find a single American who denied the legitimacy of military emancipation in those debates in Washington's cabinet or in the House of Representatives where the debate took place. Uh, and they accepted it again in the Treaty of Ghent that ended the War of 1812, right? All slaves carried away from the United States by the time the war ended were emancipated and there was no recovery of the slaves and no recompense for the slaves. Andrew Jackson offered freedom to slaves who abandoned the Seminoles during the Seminole War and he held that promise. He kept that promise, right, of all people, right? So it's well established by the time you get to the Civil War that it is legitimate in the context of war to emancipate enemy slaves in an effort to win a war or suppress a rebellion. And so in that sense, the Emancipation Proclamation comes out of that tradition. But it also reflects it also reflects the radicalization of anti-slavery policy over the course of the war up to that point. And it also squares with the Republican Party and Lincoln's program to get rid of slavery. Yes. Why does that war I mean, even the American Revolution, yes, the British offered freedom to thousands of slaves, and again in the War of 1812, but it doesn't result in emancipation, and they're not doing it in order to, to abolish slavery. What's different about the Civil War is, at least historically odd about the Civil War, is that it doesn't produce mass enslavement, it produces mass emancipation. The traditional behavior of armies during war was on full view during the Civil War, when you look at what the Confederates did when they got into Pennsylvania, rounded up free blacks and sent them bound into slavery. That's what armies do. That's what Alexander the Great's armies did in Persia. That's what Julius Caesar's armies did in Gaul. That's what all the slaves who were shipped across the Atlantic, you know, were enslaved in Africa in war. The opposite happened during the Civil War. And you need to explain why. Because the Emancipation Proclamation didn't just pop up out of nowhere. It wasn't inconsistent with Lincoln's views or the Republican Party's views or just a military expedient. There was a history here, as I mentioned, squaring right. with their anti-slavery program. Certainly right. the Southerners, the Confederates, understood what it meant. Jefferson Davis called it the most execrable measure recorded in the history of guilty man. <laughs> right, right. That's right. They had no doubt about what the Republicans were doing. Not just that, what he said was, this proves what we've said all along, that the Republicans were basically abolitionists. And in a sense, he's right. That is, confronted with the unpredictable course of the war, of any war, the Republicans respond to those contingencies in ways that are consistent with their hostility to slavery. They don't backtrack. They don't go one way and then the other, their responses to the exigencies of war are consistent with a set of assumptions about the need to put slavery on a course of ultimate extinction. The anti-slavery premises are guiding their responses to the military history of the war. You, know, you brought up the Jay Treaty and how it was debated in the House. There's a great footnote in your book. So people might be asking, well, why was the House of Representatives debating a treaty? That's the Senate's nice. job. So nice. the House wanted their say. They fought with George Washington over that. And in your footnote, you note how in the congressional record, there were 350 pages, oh, I'm sorry, in the annals of Congress, 350 pages to deal with the debate in the House over whether they should debate it. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Did you right. read all 350 of those pages? I, I don't remember. It was a <laughs> while okay. ago. It's okay if you haven't. Because <laughs> you might have fallen asleep while doing so. Right. Uh, well, well, it's true. Yeah. It's true. The Constitution yeah. does not, you know, does not give the House the right to vote on a treaty. The treaties are negotiated by the executive and ratified by the Senate. The House isn't supposed to have any role in it. You do a great job talking about the slavery implications of the Jay Treaty, the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Ghent in your book. Everyone listening to this podcast should pick up a copy of The Scorpion Sting. Thank you for not writing a thousand page book that I had to read to prepare. Only about 200 pages. Your, your, that was in 2014. Your other book, which I have here with me, in which I quoted Jefferson Davis about the Emancipation Proclamation, was uh, 2013. Freedom National. Now that is a solid, what, five, six hundred page. That is your magnum opus to date. I know you're working some other stuff. I'm going all over the place here. To circle back now to my no, initial no, 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 yeah, my initial question to you about what this anniversary means and why it's important we really understand it, even though it might seem a tired subject. In what ways are Americans misreading Lincoln's intentions today or not getting the Emancipation Proclamation right? It speaks in the first instance, to a larger problem in the way we think about the Civil War, when historians say, which most of them do nowadays, that slavery was the cause of the Civil War, they usually mean that the slaveholders seceded to protect slavery. What they don't generally agree on, and many actually deny, is that the war had any meaningful anti-slavery origins. And so the point I'm trying to make about military emancipation I would make more generally about Lincoln and the Republican Party's anti-slavery politics, which is that there is a prior history of anti-slavery politics. In the case of, of military emancipation, the critical voice in this case is John Quincy Adams, who formulates the theoretical justification for military emancipation based on a reading of the Constitution in the 1830s and 1840s. And the Republicans pick up on that. The argument is that the war powers of the Constitution vest the federal government with the power to do something they cannot do in peacetime, which is to, quote, interfere with, interfere with slavery in a state where it's legal, right? They can't abolish it but they can emancipate in significant numbers. That becomes the Republican Party doctrine, right? It becomes standard anti-slavery doctrine. And if you don't know that going into the war, there has been a tendency to say, even I've seen some historians explicitly say, that slavery was abolished inadvertently <laughs> during the war, or that the slaves freed themselves and or forced the Lincoln administration or the Republicans to adopt an anti-slavery policy when, you know, it seems to me that it's something we've talked about before we came on the air. <laughs> you can have more than one agent in a yes. major historical process. Multi-determined. Right? So yeah. So, yes, the slaves freed themselves in the sense that federal anti-slavery policy presupposed, based on their long experience with the history of fugitive slaves and the controversy over fugitive slaves, that slaves would run for their freedom if given the opportunity. Right? And so there's no reason to think that going into the war, the Republicans who were throughout the 1850s objecting to the fugitive slave law of 1850 and did not want to return slaves, and the Republican legislatures were passing laws making it hard to get fugitive slaves returned to their owners. And the secessionists are saying, one of the reasons we're leaving the union is because we can't get our slaves back. You've effectively nullified the fugitive slave law. And then to think that as soon as the war starts and slaves start running to union lines, the, are the Republicans going to reverse themselves and say, oh, yeah, we're going to return them now? It doesn't make any sense. If you cut off the anti-slavery, the prehistory of anti-slavery politics, war powers, fugitive slaves, whatever, you're not going to understand what happens during the war. Yeah, we've talked on the show it. in the past about people who erase conflict from the history of American politics. Another point you make in your book, emancipation was already happening prior to the proclamation. Slaves and uh, Benjamin Butler, the general uh, with the Contraband Act and all that, slaves had been running away to union lines and they were then effectively emancipated. What the right. proclamation did was then entice slaves to flee to union lines, and you can correct me if I'm not getting this 100% right, empower the Union Army to be an army of liberation. Wherever it went, that meant yes. freedom. Yes, 
So this is part of the problem. If you start from the assumption that nothing happened in union anti-slavery policy until the Emancipation Proclamation, and you go around asking questions, you know, what took Lincoln so long to issue the proclamation and stuff like that, you know, you won't see what the proclamation actually did that was different. If you don't appreciate that tens of thousands of slaves were already being emancipated, you're not going to know what the Emancipation Proclamation did that was different from what had been done in the first 18 months of the war. And so one of the things I discovered was that from the earliest months of the war, the emancipation policy starting in the first summer of the war was to refuse to return slaves and emancipate slaves who came within union lines voluntarily or who voluntarily stayed within union lines when the army came and the masters ran away. Right? But you were not allowed to entice slaves. You were not supposed to go on peaceful plantations and encourage slaves to leave. There's a ban on enticement. And that ban on enticement is lifted by the Emancipation Proclamation. And the result is the organization of a cadre of union officers who go into the South and actively train the Union Army, the Union Army, to go on to plantations and encourage slaves to come into Union lines, in particular, encourage young men to join the Union Army. I say this in Freedom National in the chapter you're referring to, you know, there has always been a tendency to expostulate about emancipation based on a, a reading of the text of the proclamation. But the text doesn't speak for itself. There's all sorts of things that it's assuming that if you don't know what the policy was and you don't know what the premises of the Republicans are, you're not going to see. You're not going to notice. That's right. You mentioned how the two major policy changes don't really call attention to themselves in the proclamation. And it's only about 700 right. words long. Right. Beautiful work of right. Lincolnian concision. I'll uh, right. use them, if I may. Right. That's another thing about I made a point of pointing out, you know, there's a famous attack on the language of the proclamation that is always quoted by a historian I genuinely admire named Richard Hofstadter in a chapter of the American political tradition in which he sort of denounced the proclamation as having all the moral grandeur of a bill of lading, right? And that's supposed to indicate that there was no moral impetus behind it, right? And one of the points I tried to make is that it misunderstands a large part of what abolitionist rhetoric was all about. We think of it as, you know, slavery is a sin, the slaveholders are sinners, slavery is a relic of barbarism and all that other stuff. You think of red-hot rhetoric as part of what the abolitionists are all about. But the abolitionists wrote legal treatises, legal tracts, they published court decisions. You know, they were lawyers very often. And the fact that Lincoln, a lawyer, wrote the emancipation that way does not necessarily differentiate it from the way abolitionists had been writing for a very long time. They want to make clear what the legal basis of this anti-slavery policy mm -hmm. were. Lincoln also operating in a military and political context, not in the right. abstract. He was right. a politician, right. democratically elected one. What you just said there made me think of that question, well, if it weren't for the war, we wouldn't have had military emancipation, then who knows how long slavery would have lasted, meaning this was just a right. military expedient. But you can turn that question around and say, well, you can't talk about the war without talking about the conflict over slavery that caused the war. Exactly. Exactly. Without anti-slavery politics, without the anti-slavery constitutionalism that I wrote about in my last book, without that, there is no war. There's no reason for the slave states to secede. If everyone in the North agreed with William Lloyd Garrison, that Congress did not have the power to ban slavery from the Western territories, that slaves who escaped to Northern states did not have the presumption of freedom and due process rights, if Congress did not have the power to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C., if Congress did not have the power to regulate the coastwise slave trade, if Congress couldn't do anything the way William Lloyd Garrison said, because the Constitution was completely pro-slavery in the way that John C. Calhoun and Jefferson Davis believed. If that were the case, there's no civil war. There's no reason to secede when the Republican Party 
takes control or wins the 1860 elections. There's no reason for there to be a war. So to say that it's hard to imagine emancipation without the war or blame it entirely on the war is problematic in two ways. The first way we've already mentioned, wars don't lead automatically to mass emancipation. Right? They usually lead to the opposite. So there has to be some other explanation. And second, there is no war. There is no war unless there's anti-slavery politics. And Lincoln and the Republicans wanted to get rid of slavery, so the war gave them an opportunity to do that. It wasn't just a a mechanism to crush the South. As you said before, it could be a lot of things all at once. Right. It wasn't simply to restore the Union. It was to restore a particular kind of Union they believed the founders had intended to create. And I know I want to get to the cordon of freedom because it's so important to understanding this progression in Republican politics in the 1850s. But, you know, there's another issue here, too, that I haven't raised yet, and that is race and racism. This just wasn't a, a conflict about constitutional scruples. But about the Constitution, there is an issue, fundamental issue in your book, The Scorpion Sting, that keeps coming back as I read it. It was the issue that vexed American politics from day one of the Republic. What power did the Constitution actually give to Congress, the federal government, to regulate or abolish slavery? So, I mean, that yeah, they right. were. Yeah. Right. It's, it's what historians call the federal consensus, right? It's a very odd thing. When historians fight about the Constitution, about whether the Constitution is a pro-slavery document or an anti-slavery document or some compromise between the two. The odd thing for me about these debates when they're looking at the Fugitive Slave Clause or the Three-Fifths Clause or whatever, the Domestic Insurrections Clause, the most important guiding constitutional principle as far as the federal government's relationship to slavery isn't in the Constitution. It's federalism which is generally in the Constitution, but the federalism applied to the question of slavery means that slavery is understood to be a state institution over which the federal government has no control, right? So that means two things. It means the federal government cannot interfere with abolition in the northern states, which was never real. Well, it does become a problem in the 1850s when the slaveholders are saying, we want to come into your states and yeah. capture our So much slaves. for state rights, but go ahead. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. But it's mostly an inhibition on what anti-slavery politics is capable of doing. It means that Congress can never pass a law abolishing slavery in a state. And one of the things that arises, for example, as a, as a pseudo-compromise proposal during the secession crisis is a proposal to take that universally accepted principle, the federal consensus, Congress has no power to abolish slavery in the state, and actually put it into the Constitution. Right. And Lincoln actually endorses it. But it's not going to change anything. It's, it's what everybody already believed. And the proof of that is that at no point during the Civil War did Congress pass a law abolishing slavery in a state. That is not how slavery got abolished. They had to rewrite the Constitution to bypass the states so that, as the 13th Amendment said, slavery shall exist nowhere in the United States, anywhere. Right? So it gets abolished nationwide. It doesn't get abolished state by state. And the answer to that question, you know, what power do we have, which I, in a sense is a kind of a strange question. This is our government, so of course we have the power to do things. But, you know, the Constitution does mean something. So the answer to that was the cordon of freedom. You know, for a while yes. I used to subscribe to the idea that the Southerners were, or the, the secessionists, I should say, secessionists, were irrational hotheads driven over the cliff right. by the South Carolinians. And there's probably some truth right. to that. No, the Southerners saw what was happening. They could see the future of slavery if they were cordoned, could not expand. Yes. So James yes. Oakes, tell us about so, the cordon of freedom. This is, this is if you take the various policies that are already in dispute, even in the 1780s, the northern and southern states are already disputing with one another over the status of fugitive slaves. The northern states are operating on the presumption of freedom and they want to protect their free blacks from kidnapping and accused fugitives guaranteed the rights of due process. And the southern states object. And these fights are between governors generally. You see them between Massachusetts and South Carolina. So you see them. So you take that is one thing the Northern states are committed to, make the free states really free states, you know? And then the second policy is ban slavery from the territories, 
right? Don't allow the expansion of slavery in any way. Federal government can't abolish slavery in the state, but it controls the territories. It can abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. It can regulate the domestic slave trade, maybe. And when the Supreme Court says it can't regulate the interstate slave trade, it can still regulate the coastwise slave trade. That is the number of slaves who are carried on ships from Alexandria or Baltimore down to Mobile or New Orleans, right? And if you do all these things, if you establish free oceans, free states, free territories, you surround the South with what was called the cordon of freedom and not allow slavery to expand, slavery would eventually die. The assumption was that a slave economy, this was all the way back to the 18th century, it's in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, then it was already being talked about before then. Slave economies are intrinsically unproductive. They have they irrational the features, yeah. right? And Republicans took this as a given, and they believed that slavery needed to expand to survive. If you stopped it from expanding, it gradually would force a weakening of slavery starting in the Upper South, you know, and things like that. It's this policy, it's this commitment to surrounding the slave states that is why the slave states secede when Lincoln is elected, because he's committed to this. But one of the questions you get is, well, would it have worked without a war? My basic answer is, who cares? It, we had a war, yeah. and that's how it happened. And the war didn't come out of left field. So, yeah. And the war didn't come out of left field. There are plenty of historians, really prominent, smart historians, Alan Nevins, Eugene Genovese, uh, lots of historians who have argued that preventing the expansion of slavery was a death sentence. The slave economy did, in fact, need to expand to survive. If you just look at the trajectory of the American economy over the course of the 19th century, you know, the, the northern economy is clearly growing far more rapidly than the southern economy. It's barely begun to industrialize before this, by the time the Civil War starts. And the industrialization just shoots off in the late 19th century. It's not hard to imagine a scenario in which the northern economy becomes so overwhelming and the north becomes so powerful politically that they could just start saying, you know what else we're going to do? We're going to make every port, every federal installation in the South will be free labor. Or amend the Constitution once you have 75 percent. Yeah, that's hard to imagine. I mean, with 15 slave states, think about today, yeah, that's right, yeah. you'd need 60 states, right? Yeah. But you could imagine the federal government cracking down in ways that you know, for example, if they could theoretically say, you know what, we're going to ban the interstate slave trade. What would happen to slavery if you banned the yeah. interstate slave trade? Or at least getting the majority in the Senate, which was the pro-slavery bulwark right. by this point. Right. And what if you put what if you put a direct tax on the sale of every slave? There's all sorts of ways you can imagine the anti-slavery party becoming more and more aggressive in its determination yeah. to destroy the system. On the other hand, slavery is profitable. The 1850s, it's more profitable. It's probably the most profitable decade in the history of slavery in the United States. The slave South is the largest, wealthiest slave economy on the face of the earth. It's not hard to imagine. It persists. Man, to, it's a powerful you know, institution with can, 4 million it, slaves. I don't know what would have happened. The problem is when people ask me that question, well, would it have worked without a war? They're operating on the premise that they know the answer and the answer is nothing would have happened. And I don't know the answer no. and they don't know the answer either. I think it's you know? unknowable. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because slaveholders or the slaveocracy, they belied a certain insecurity or weakness. That is why they wanted to expand to the South, the filibusters, yes. right? They wanted to... And they did, I think. Yes. William Walker, I think was his name, went to yeah. Nicaragua. Yeah, he was one of them. Narciso Lopez. Yeah. They wanted Cuba. They wanted Central America. Get you know, them to so, be slave yeah, states. Yeah. Get two more slave right. state senators. Right. right. Yeah. Jefferson Davis proposed as a compromise measure to extend the Missouri Compromise to the Pacific Coast, which would have required slicing California in two and making Southern California a slave state. You know, that's the compromise proposal that he's coming up with that is supposedly makes him a moderate. Well, Alexander Stevens was a, a moderate, and he delivered the infamous Cornerstone speech right. explaining that right. uh, slavery, right. the peculiar institution, was the cornerstone for a proper civilization. So, For the certain confederacy, yeah. it's based on this great principle of the racial inferiority of blacks yeah. as uniquely suited to slavery. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, race yeah. and racism, that is an important issue. And probably in that issue, we can find reasons why 
the world historical importance of the events we're talking about are dismissed by some historians today. And we'll get to a, a book that was recently reviewed by our friend Sean Wilentz. A few months ago, Jamel Bowie, writing in the New York Times, wrote an essay about how, yes, Republicans, anti-slavery politicians were committed to ending slavery, but they weren't all that committed to racial equality. And you, you pointed out how, again, it could be many things at once. That, yes, Republicans were also, or many Republicans were also committed to what we call equal rights today, right, has a different meaning back then. Right. Yeah, that right. wasn't such a great question right. the way I phrased that, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. I have generally liked Jamel Bowie's columns on history. It seems to me he reads more widely and more carefully than other people at the New York Times, for example. And this particular column I thought was a mistake because I think we now have abundant evidence. Like in the last year or two, two huge books, major books have come out demonstrating what are known as the anti-slavery origins of the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment established the principle of civic equality in the United States. The birthright citizenship, blacks are citizens and they are entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizenship. And the Civil Rights Act of 1866 specifies what many of those are. The 15th Amendment likewise comes out of a long debate in the North among Northerners over black voting rights. And the Republicans tended to take the side in favor of black voting rights. So there is in the anti-slavery movement, a commitment to equality, not social equality. We still don't have a commitment to social equality in yes. any meaningful sense in this country. But to civic equality, to equal voting rights, yes, that's there as part of the anti-slavery movement. And it's not an accident that when the Civil War ends, the Republicans give us not only a 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, but a 14th and 15th Amendment as well. They both come out of the anti-slavery movement. I think the words you used to me in our exchange was, let's drop the moral or moralist hierarchy. Right. When we're oh, trying yeah, to, yeah, 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 to put right. uh, an order of importance, the reason why people did these important things. Well, I mean something different. I've said this before. There is a tendency to say, to assume that there is a moral hierarchy of arguments against slavery. And at the top of the moral hierarchy is a kind of humanitarian concern for the oppression of the black slaves. And then go down the hierarchy and you'll get an argument for the disproportionate influence of the slaveholders in federal policy, the slave power, the economic backwardness of slave society. There's a whole lot of social, political, economic yeah. reasons. And my complaint about that is that these are intellectual history categories, right? You're taking anti-slavery arguments and they're chopping them up into different intellectual categories, and you're assuming that those intellectual categories map onto people. And they don't. The people who tend to dislike the slave power's influence in national politics tend also to think slavery is immoral. If you think slavery is immoral, you're tending also, you will also tend to think it's economically backward. The intellectual categories are not the same thing as human categories, right? And so take Eric Foner's first book, Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, that established you know, the significance of free labor ideology, the, the, the superiority of a free labor system over a slave labor system. And people responded to that book often by saying, you see, it's merely an economic argument, as though the superiority of a society based on free labor were simply an economic argument. It's not. There's a lot more to a free labor argument than simply an economic argument. I mean, look at that. And the backwardness and, and of the, the South and the immiseration of the entire population because of... Right. right. Yeah. And so when Lincoln says something like, you can see it in, in the way he argues, when Lincoln says something like, in the bread she earns from the sweat of her brow, the black woman is my equal and the equal of any living man. That's free labor ideology. But it's free labor ideology framed in biblical language, right? It's not just an economic argument. There's a moral imperative built into that language that I think you can't separate from an economic argument or a sociological argument. Yeah, thank you for making a, cleaning up my messy question there. I mean, another one of these arguments is that, well, the majority of Northern whites could only care about this once they saw the, the threat to white freedom 
from the encroachments of the slave power. Well, in a democracy, you need to get people on board with your program. Yeah, or, I yeah, think you know. I don't think you needed to persuade Northerners that slavery was immoral. I think you know one of the complaints that slaveholders had, that Jefferson Davis, for example, had, was that by the late antebellum period, by the 1830s, 40s, 50s, you know, children had grown up in societies that had abolished slavery, and they were hearing anti-slavery sermons in their churches on Sunday. They were listening to anti-slavery speeches. They they were learning it in their school books. They're reading anti-slavery texts in their school books. They grow up in a society that takes the superiority of abolition, the benefits of abolition, the desirability of abolition as a given, right? You, what you needed to persuade Northerners of wasn't that slavery was immoral. You needed to persuade them that anti-slavery was a priority. And to do that, you needed to show that they had a direct interest in this, that there was a threat to them. The way things are going, they're going to sweep into the Western territories and deprive settlers of the opportunities because slaveholders gobble up the best lands on the riverbanks like that. They're going to come into our northern communities with slave catchers and start forcing us to participate in their own slave laws. They're going to deprive us of our free speech rights by not allowing our petitions to be accepted in Congress. You know, there's, there's all sorts of ways in which those are necessary, desirable things to do if you want to build an anti-slavery coalition that's going to put down slavery. It's not a problem. For you. It's that's politics. That's what you need to do. That's the way you do it. That's, you think about any number good. of problems today that shouldn't exist anymore, right? We'd like to think in the 21st century. But to get people to care about them is difficult. Right. <laughs> Even if yes. they over conversation. You see this all the time. You see this all the time with something like climate change, right? How do you get people to care about something as abstract as climate change? You tell them, you know, look, you can't get insurance in Florida anymore for your house, right? You're running out of water in the Southwest. You have to make people feel, and it's not an illegitimate way to do it. It's, yeah. it's how you do it. And it doesn't mean that they only cared about white people. That's not what it means. It means that they came to see that the problem of slavery was bigger. You know, it was a national problem. So, you know, they had some responsibility for no, taking care of it. Yeah, complicity in the system, right? If you're benefiting, even if the benefit is small, right? I mean, we're all complicit in right. capitalism, even people who say that right. they're not big right. fans of it, right. if, or they don't like Amazon and how right. Amazon treats its workers. They're not going to stop buying their Apple yes. phones because they're produced in China. They're yeah. not going to stop buying their Nike yeah. sneakers. They're not going right. to. I promise to get back to the if emancipation. You, if, if you're interested yeah. in complicity, yeah. if that's my complaint about yeah. it, the complicity arguments. Are a dime a dozen, anywhere. yeah. Sorry they're for bringing that They're just everywhere. Up. Everything's, everybody's complicit. Well, it's a serious problem in the field right now because there's an obsession with complicity and demonstrating to the point where they actually exaggerate complicity as though complicity gets you anywhere. I don't yeah. think it gets you anywhere. I am going to return to the Emancipation Proclamation, but one more point about this. From reading your work and others, Kate Mazur's book last year, I have to admit to being surprised at the level of racial equality beliefs that existed in mid-19th right. century society. I think maybe right. where there's some confusion is when you talk to somebody today about what rights do you have as an American citizen, as a human being? It's everything, right? right? Or I should say it's supposed to be everything. Civil rights, voting rights, property rights, etc. But in the mid-19th century, you would have certain rights as a human being, your basic rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, right to your own self, right. your own property, your own labor. But that doesn't necessarily mean then you can sit on a jury or hold office or vote. And then there was the issue of privileges and immunities in the Constitution and which state right. you happen to be standing right. in at any one time. So there were like layers of, right. of rights. And it's always contested. Take something like voting. Is voting a right? Is voting one of the privileges of citizenship, for example? Right? Is it? Well, you know, my son had a U.S. passport when he was two. <laughs> he couldn't vote till he was 18. Yeah. You could be a citizen and not have the right to vote. And women were citizens long before they had the right to vote. And one of the arguments against the Dred Scott decision, for example, was that the fact that northern states, many northern states did not allow blacks to vote was not proof that they were not citizens because voting is not one of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. You don't get the notion of voting as a right until much, much later, late 19th, 20th century.
Yeah. Even the 15th Amendment does not create a right to vote. It simply bans discrimination in voting on the basis of race. There were disputes over whether black people were allowed to walk into a certain state if they had rights in one state, but not in that other state. Yeah. That's what the pro-slavery constitutionalists were saying. That's what Tony said, Judge Roger Tony said in the Dred Scott decision. Yeah. Just because New York has given you citizenship doesn't mean that yeah, you have U.S. citizenship. Now, that was a real perversion and repudiation of a fundamental premise of Americans up to that point. The Constitution yeah. says that a citizen of one state is entitled to the privileges, all the privileges and immunities of citizenship in the several states. That suggests that if you're a citizen of New York, you are also a citizen. It's hard not to read that that way. But Tawny was, the pro-slavery constitutions were saying something very different, That's saying right. just because you're a citizen of New York doesn't mean you're a U.S. citizen. And that was a fundamental divide between anti-slavery and pro-slavery. For instance, Massachusetts versus Louisiana, right? Uh, free black American citizens on a boat left Massachusetts. When they went to Louisiana, they were just thrown in jail, right? right? Horrible. Yes. But the Louisianans would say, well, you know, your privileges and immunities, you have to abide by our privileges and immunities. Yes, because they're operating, the southern states are operating on the presumption of slavery. If you're black, you're a slave. And the northern states are operating on the presumption that if you're standing on free soil or in Massachusetts or New York, you're presumptively free. And if you're free and you were born here, you're a citizen. And to jail someone automatically when they reach Charleston or as a sailor on a ship, that's a violation of the Constitution because the Constitution recognizes the citizenship of everyone who is a citizen of the state. That's a fundamental conflict in yes. the United States over what it means, what citizenship was, and whether the states are supposed to acknowledge it. It's a comedy problem here in, in law, right? It's C-O-M-I-T-Y. C-O-M-I-T-Y. Yeah. Right. It's, and it shows up all the time in the fugitive slave stuff, too. Right. So I did promise I would return to the Emancipation Proclamation. Thank you for helping me out of the maze of my own uh, thoughts here, James Oak. So in the end, Lincoln wanted to do this, but he was skeptical about it, whether it would be effective, not whether he had the authority to do it. He had the authority under the war powers, right? And he also was waiting for a military victory. But in the end, I guess he got the right conditions, despite his skepticism. These questions about when he wrote it, when he decided, these these are tricky questions. And my own feeling about this is that Congress passes the Second Confiscation Act. It's the last day of Congress in July of 1862. As was true then, and maybe true now, I don't know, but what was true back then, at the very end of a session, Congress would pass a spate of laws that required presidential authorization, presidential initiative, executive action orders. And he comes into the next cabinet meeting with a sheaf of orders based on what Congress has just done, the various laws. One of them was the Second Confiscation Act, and the Second Confiscation Act appeared to require a proclamation specifically a proclamation that specified which areas were in rebellion and which were not and would therefore be subject to emancipation. So he comes in with a draft of the proclamation. So I think the best argument for when he decided is when Congress passed the law. Right? But what happens after that, why he didn't immediately issue it, why it took him so long, when he issued it, all of the evidence we have is retrospective. You know, He tells the painter, carpenter, or some time later, a year or two later, that when he introduced this to the cabinet, there were various, somebody said, you don't do it this way. Somebody says, wait, somebody says it's not time. But Seward supposedly said to him, you know, we've just had this embarrassing military setback on the peninsula. McClellan had failed to take Richmond, as he wanted to do. And if we issue the proclamation now, it will look like a desperate measure in the, in the wake of military failure. Now, Again, that's retrospective. What makes it what makes it more credible to me is what he actually does and says when he does it, which is right after the Union Army wins, technically wins the battle at Antietam and yeah. sends Robert E. Lee back to Virginia, failed invasion, Lincoln comes to the cabinet and says, I promised that if we won this if we had a military victory like this, I would issue it. That seems to me to suggest that the recollection that Lincoln had later about Seward was probably reliable, right? Okay. Because he waits for a victory. 
and he gets the victory and he issues the uh, the preliminary proclamation. It's an indication of the degree to which anti-slavery policy is thoroughly integrated into the history of the war itself. You know, there's no such thing as a decisive battle, but there are battles that have consequences politically. There's and, some Cathal Nolan there, no decisive them, battles, right? but right. a lot of attritional battles. Well, yeah, I mean, the Antietam yeah. battle was a was carnage. It's terrible. And in yeah. some ways, it was, it was a Union victory in the most technical military sense. That is, Lee withdraws from the battlefield, and that makes the Union army the victor, right? Yeah. But as a battle, it was, in military terms, it was not decisive. It didn't alter the balance of forces between the Union and the, yeah. and the Confederacy in any meaningful way. And you still got two, three more years of war after that. So, right, but it's significant politically, and in, in terms of the history of emancipation, because that's where the Emancipation Proclamation comes. I would correct one thing, misimpression. When Lincoln issues that preliminary proclamation, he doesn't simply justify it on the basis of his war powers as commander in chief. He also cites the Second Confiscation Act as congressional authorization yes. for the proclamation. So it's both Congress and the Constitution that he's relying on. I do allegedly prepare for these interviews, but um, as you can tell, <laughs> you know, I've had a few missteps here. That's okay. That's no, no, why, no, 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 no. That's not a misstep. No, I, that's, no not that, a that's why you're here. Just a clarification. <laughs> no one would listen if it was just me talking. <laughs> so... Okay. Just a clarification. No, no. Uh, we've you, you're a careful reader, Martin. You don't have uh, you don't have anything to worry about. Yeah, we've um, covered all the ground I wanted to cover, but I do want to ask you: What the hell is going on in the historical profession? This is related to our conversation, so I'll brief background. Chris Monjopra, historian at Tufts University, has written many books about slavery and race. He just came out with a book called Black Ghost of Empire, The Long Death of Slavery and the Failure of Emancipation. Our friend Sean Wilentz reviewed his book for the New York Review of Books, and the headline for that article by Sean is The Emancipator's Vision. I'll share a passage from Sean's review here. Manjapra writes in his introduction, emancipations provided a failed pathway to justice. Far from liberating, he contends, they aggravated slavery's historical trauma and extended white supremacist rule and anti-blackness. This was not due, he emphasizes, either to faulty implementation or to the flaws in the process. From the start, emancipation was a systematic effort to extend racial oppression and exploitation, the result of careful planning and international coordination among European and American states over many generations. It also seems that Manjapra subscribes to the idea that is called Thirteentherism, that the Thirteenth Amendment didn't end slavery. It extended it or prolonged it under a different name. As I said, what the hell is going on in the historical profession? You know, I don't want to make more of this than it is, but it's out there. This stuff is out there. You know, I haven't read the book, so I can't really comment on it. It is something that's out there. It goes back to the very first question you asked me at the beginning of this interview. You know, I have had it in my classes. I have had students say, you know, slavery was never really abolished. African-American students saying, we're still slaves. You know, they're sitting in air-conditioned offices with, with five-year packages of fellowships being paid to read books and, and saying that they're still enslaved. My answer to that is... If we still have slaves, then we still need anti-slavery politics. So should we repeal the laws that make it a crime to teach black people to read? Well, there are no such laws. Should we close down the slave auction houses? Well, we don't have slave auction houses. Shall we legalize the marriages of black men and women? Well, we don't have to do that because we don't have slavery anymore. If you're going to say we still have slavery, then we have to have a politics designed to abolish slavery. No politics designed to abolish slavery is viable now because none of the things we would have to do to get slavery abolished need to be done. We have a different set of problems that arise from the particular conditions we're in at this moment. Right? Yeah, the conditions and, of the prisons are bad enough without equating them to slavery. There's both a specific and a generic response to that, that they're talking about a moment. This is the critique of 13thism focused on this that was published in the journal Liberties, focused on the fact that they tend to focus on prison labor in particular convict labor in the South in the late 19th century as the continuation of slavery. There are several problems with that. One is that 
prison labor existed long before slavery. Free men were sentenced to prison and forced to labor too. Slavery is not just prison labor. Second, prisoners' marriages are not nullified. Their children do not inherit the condition. It is not permanent. Every prisoner who has to work is usually sentenced to a specific term of years. It's not perpetual. It's not inherited. It is not slavery. It's terrible. It's awful. But it's not slavery. It's something else. You need a different kind of politics to abolish that kind of system because it's not the same system. Second, it lasts for a rather limited period of time in the late 19th and early 20th century, the kind of thing they're talking about. And thirdly, and most significant to me, in 1860, 97% of the Blacks in the South were enslaved. In 1890. 3% of the adult male Blacks were in prison. It's just not the same system. The point is, if you're going to call it slavery, then you need an anti-slavery politics. But an anti-slavery politics isn't going to get you out of that system, right? Yeah. It's also a commentary on our country. Well, there's a kind of idealist interpretation there that takes an idea, racism, and sees it as continuous from the founding of the country and sees that the justification for slavery sounds like the justification for sharecropping or Jim Crow, the Jim Crow order in the late 19th century and things like that. And you see the continuation of an idea and you say, see, nothing has changed. And that just strikes me as, you know, <laughs> there were Christian apologists for slavery and Christian apologists for Jim Crow and Christian apologists for all sorts of oppression and Christian critics. And are you going to say that the problem is Christianity? These ideas exist in specific historical contexts to justify particular forms of social oppression. And the fact that there is a racist justification for the Jim Crow order does not mean the Jim Crow order is the same thing as slavery or the same thing as where we are right now. It's an idea that's familiar, and it's not even clear to me that the ideas are familiar. Uh, the idea that the 13th Amendment was written as a diabolical plot you know, to basically. Oh, that's hit. just a that's just a, a historically ignorant reading of what the what that second phrase of the anti-slavery amendment was all about. Thomas Jefferson and the Continental Congress passed this law in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance, and it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the Northwest Territories except as punishment for crime, whereof the the person shall have been duly convicted. Okay, involuntary servitude is not the same thing as slavery. Involuntary servitude is prison labor and stuff like that. It's not the same thing, so it's not clear. But the point is that it abolished slavery in the Northwest Territories. And from that moment on, all anti-slavery people lobbed onto that as proof that the founders had committed themselves in some fundamental way to abolishing slavery, at least in the Northwest Territories. So every state constitution that comes along abolishes slavery uses that language. When Congress gets into a, a fight over the disposition of the territories taken from Mexico in the 1840s, the proposal, the famous Wilmot Proviso, is written that way, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist. When it comes to the 13th Amendment and the People passing it are facing enemies, you know, Northern Democrats who are saying this unconstitutional amendment. They use the language of the Northwest Ordinance to show that they're basing their commitment to abolishing slavery on something inherited from the founders. It has nothing to do with a slippery, sliding, deliberate attempt to slip something into the 13th Amendment that will actually perpetuate slavery. That's a genuinely perverse reading of the 13th Amendment. But it is out there, basically the yeah, idea. Yeah, it's out there. Yeah, well, that, I can't, I can't, no. I can't be responsible for that. I mean, I can do what I can, <laughs> yes. but it, it's perverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, I agree. It's beyond the realm of, uh, it's, it's beyond the realm of rationality. It's frankly stupid. I guess where I'm coming from is the 13th Amendment was obviously not a fraud or a deliberate fraud of any kind. And as you know from listening to the show and being on it several times, I'm not a flag-waving nut who needs a patriotic history. Apologies to any flag-waving nuts who might be listening. But at the same time, this stuff coming from the other end of the spectrum, the middle becomes razor thin. Well, you know, Final thoughts. another way of responding to 13therism is to say, I defy anyone making that claim 
to go into the debates over the 13th Amendment in the House of Representatives or the Senate and find me evidence to demonstrate what you're saying the 13th Amendment is all about. And you won't. You won't. There is not one shred of evidence that the 13th Amendment was designed to do what these critics of the 13th Amendment are saying. I guess there's a fundamental difference between folks who might look at the abolition of slavery as incomplete as far as trying to get our country to a place of true racial equality and justice. But it was still a monumental achievement, historical achievement, versus folks who say, as you did, well, nothing really changed. Unfinished revolution. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's Eric Foner's description, you know, the, the yeah. for Reconstruction, and I would say the same thing about emancipation. It's a revolution, but it's not finished. What makes it unfinished to me is not the persistence of racism. It's something else. It's other things. It's the inability to redistribute land, for example. The, the, it was never going to happen. They're never going to redistribute land. We just don't do that in this country very much. And federalism. At some point, Power is going to return to the states. If you haven't redistributed the land, it means that the slaveholding class is going to reemerge as a landlord class. The freed people are going to have to go back to work on plantations, maybe not the same owner of the plantations and not the same set of social relations because sharecropping is different. But the landlord class is still there. It's going to exercise disproportionate power and federalism. You know, when we talk about those horrible Supreme Court decisions in the late 19th century that legitimize ultimately Plessy versus Ferguson, those decisions don't legalize segregation. They return the right to segregate to the states. Right. Because the northern states don't all of a sudden start passing segregation laws after the Plessy decision is handed down. It's federalism combined with the fact that the incomplete revolution is based on the fact that it's impossible to imagine that they were going to redistribute the land in the aftermath of slavery's destruction. And so you've said that the Civil War was a capitalist revolution replacing slave labor with a different kind of labor in the South. Yeah. Sharecropping. And there's disagreements among historians of whether or not sharecropping can be understood as a, a free labor system, a genuinely free labor system or some other kind of non-capitalist system or some kind of hybrid between capitalism. But it's not slavery anymore. It's the notion of a property right in human beings is destroyed. And so the relationships between slaveholders and slaves is destroyed. And instead, a new set of social relationships between landlords and sharecroppers emerges. How you want to define those is, is subject to debate, but so, it's not the same thing. The sharecroppers are restless, right? At the end of every year, you see massive migrations from, of, this, of the freed people from one looking for a better contract. As slaves at the end of the year cannot go to another master looking around. That migration has important consequences for the demographic and political history of the South. That system is in place after World War I, during World War I, when all of a sudden there's opportunities for blacks in the North and thousands and thousands and thousands of sharecroppers abandon the farms and plantations and move to the North. They can't do that with slavery. Yeah, that's that. possible because there was a 13th Amendment. The landlord-sharecropper relationship is not the same. Yeah. The landlords don't have a property right in the people. There. So, Marriages are legal. The segregated schools, inferior segregated schools are terrible, but they're not the same thing as living in a place where it's a crime to teach a slave to read. Agreed. So, James Oakes, I promised that I would not ask you about your book. Sean, by the way, hates it if I ask him about how his book is coming. If I ever, if I ever interview Robert Caro, I know not to ask him about <laughs> volume 95 of his LBJ I just series. had a conversation the other day about that. Is he going yeah, to right. survive to finish his Don't masterful? Don't jinx him. No, but because I love your work, how is the book on the Civil War coming? Don't ask me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's going to be a while, but it's coming. Well, James Oakes, good luck with that book. And in the meantime, you are always welcome on the podcast. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we'll continue to kick off the new year by taking a look at the year ahead. President Biden's foreign policy, year three. We'll be joined by Washington Times reporters Guy Taylor and Ben Wolfgang. Is there a Biden doctrine? And if so, what does it mean? That's next as we report History As It Happens, podcast from The Washington Times.